Joining me on the line in just a second is Toby Young. Toby is the Associate Editor of The Spectator in the UK, as well as being the General Secretary of the Free Speech Union and the editor of LockdownSceptics.org. Toby is a very important voice right now because he is arguing in public fearlessly against the so-called virtues of the cruel and, quite frankly, absurd lockdown rules. Toby, they've been very good at building theoretical models predicting mass death from the virus, but where are the models forecasting the consequences of these lockdowns? Yeah, well, that's a really good point, Nicholas. Um, One of the things that's been absent from this debate, certainly in the UK, but I'm sure in other countries too, has been any robust cost-benefit analysis of the lockdown policy. Um, So there was a piece in the Financial Times a few months ago uh, which looked in great detail at the uh, week leading up to the decision made by Boris Johnson and his cabinet to um, quarantine everybody in the UK, the healthy as well as the sick. That decision was made on March 23rd, and it was announced at a meeting of COBRA, which is the sort of uh, uh, emergency committee of the cabinet. Um, And uh, at the COBRA meeting where this decision was announced, uh, an MP called Jesse Norman, who's written a biography of Edmund Burke, among other things, but is... uh, quite a thoughtful, conservative intellectual. Uh, He asked Michael Gove, um, the cabinet minister chairing that meeting of COBRA, uh, whether a cost benefit analysis had been done. Did the government know um, uh, when it was evaluating this policy, whether the benefits would outweigh the costs, given that it was clearly going to uh, cost a great deal? and not just economically, uh, as you say, in terms of uh, public health and in particular mental health. Um, and um, he just got blank looks. They hadn't, it, it was as though it hadn't even occurred to them uh, to do a cost benefit analysis before making this decision. And I don't think any country anywhere in the world um, that has locked down its population uh, before doing that uh, properly evaluated that policy uh, by doing Um, a proper cost-benefit analysis. And um, more recently, there's a group of Conservative MPs in the House of Commons um, called the um, uh, COVID Recovery Group and uh, the CRG. And um, they they asked the government to uh, produce a cost-benefit analysis before asking Parliament to approve another lockdown. And, um, of course, the government didn't do that. And it did it did ask the House of Commons to approve another lockdown and then a third lockdown more recently. And it still hasn't produced a cost benefit analysis. Uh, I mean, the, 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 the lockdown skeptics case, the kind of kernel of the case is that um, lockdowns indiscriminately uh, locking up, uh, imprisoning in their homes, the healthy as well as their sick, uh, the healthy as well as the sick, which is a a policy that has never been tried before as a way to mitigate the impact of a pandemic, not in this way, um, that, uh, that that policy causes more harm than it prevents. Um, and uh, uh, no one's been able to rebut that because no one has been able to show by doing a cost benefit analysis that that isn't the case. Uh, and I think the reason for suspecting it is the case in the absence of that cost benefit analysis is that we know Uh, from numerous international studies that the impact of lockdowns on COVID mortality is negligible. Um, The rise and fall of COVID infections and deaths seems to follow a Gompoltz curve. um, uh, And there doesn't seem to be any kink in that curve as a result of lockdowns being introduced. It follows pretty much the same life cycle wherever it's broken out. Um, And um, uh, if you compare uh, those states that have locked down in the US with those that didn't, uh, there's no no reason to think that, well, there's no evidence that those states which did shut down had fewer deaths per million than those states that didn't in the spring. Uh, There are countries which didn't lock down in the spring, like Sweden, relied entirely on voluntary Um, uh, uh, social distancing and they didn't fare any worse 
than countries that did lock down in Europe, like Italy, Spain, France, the United Kingdom, Portugal. Um, uh, uh, those countries that locked down hard and fast, like um, Peru, which I believe has the most severe lockdown in the world or had the most severe lockdown in the world, also had the highest number of deaths per million. Uh, so there doesn't seem to be any signal in the noise, no reason to think that locking down entire populations, quarantining people in their homes is an effective way of reducing mortality from this particular virus. Um, uh, but there is an overwhelming amount of evidence that that policy causes huge, colossal, uh, huge collateral damage, um, uh, not only to the economy, you know, the cost to the British taxpayer of the three lockdowns we've had is sort of 400 billion and climbing, um, uh, likely to be a trillion, I think, when everything uh, has fallen out. Um, uh, then there's the uh, impact on children's education by closing schools, mm. um, which is catastrophic. Uh, there's the impact on people's mental health. We have a rise in suicides, a rise in, in teenagers requiring uh, mental health support, completely overwhelming the NHS in that respect. Um, uh, there's um, uh, the uh, delayed operations, the cancellation of cancer screening programs. I mean, all of these things have a catastrophic impact in developed societies like Australia and Britain. But they have an even more devastating impact in the developing world, in oh, countries right. like South Africa. So I just want to talk about the children there for a second, because we have a situation where you've got kids as young as basically beginning school, and they're not now. And we don't know what sort of impact this is going to have on stunting social, educational development as well as they get older. You have kids that are now used to wearing masks and being told you're not going to school, you're not going uh, out without any real reason. It's sophistry from so-called experts that people seem to willingly put all their faith into almost half the population I'd say here is happily walking to the gallows. The willingness of um, people uh, to go along with these draconian stay-at-home orders and the closure of schools, of universities, of so-called non-essential businesses, um, that has been quite surprising. Um, I've been disappointed by how easily people have surrendered their ancient liberties. Um, and actually, if you look at Germany, there have been many more protests and much larger, much better supported protests against Germany's lockdowns than there have been in the UK against our lockdowns. And, you know, we think of the Germans as these um, rule following, you know, uh, uh, upstanding um, uh, members uh, of, of a kind of well-functioning state that, you know, do as they're told. Mm. Um, and we think of ourselves, the British and, and the Australians um, as these sort of Rabelaisian rule breakers who enjoy, you know, a night out, uh, often ignore the rules um, because, you know, they, they guard their freedom um, uh, more preciously than almost anything else. And yet that hasn't that hasn't that hasn't come to pass during, uh, you know, the past year and even the present month. Uh, you know, I, I think Australians in particular, you know, I've always thought of Australians as these, you know, ornery, cussed, um, uh, you know, impossible to boss around, um, uh, you know, um, uh, ferocious defenders of individual liberty and always very resistant to attempts by the state to take away those liberties. And yet, you know, if you look at what's happened in states like Victoria, um, uh, the uh, it's almost as though overnight they became totalitarian societies and the vast majority of the public went along with it. I mean, there have been some there's been some resistance, uh, but not a great deal. And I think the I think the the the, the I think the the the, 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 the kind of explanation for this apparent conundrum um, isn't that we've simply misread 
these national characteristics. I think it's that it shows just how easily people can be frightened into surrendering their liberty if they really believe that um, their health and in fact their lives may be at stake. If they think that we're in the midst of a deadly pandemic, they are willing to sacrifice you know, a great deal uh, in order to not only save themselves, but also save their loved ones and to do what they can to try and uh, minimise the number of deaths arising out of mm. the pandemic. But I think it's because, as you say, um, governments and the media around the world have um, pumped out this unrelenting diet of, you know, fear um, about uh coronavirus. I think that's why people have been so compliant on the whole. I think that it did take a few steps to get them to be so compliant. And I think that what we have now is my, my take on it is that, look, around 52 percent of Australians now identify as having um, no religion. So they're either atheist or irreligious. Um, uh, what was once a Christian nation, very much in the same light as America, at least it, it, it was a... Um, it was a benefactor of Christendom and Western Christendom. But now we have roughly 50% of almost in all the main Western countries, the UK, America and Australia, they reject God, okay? And what happens then is you've got people that are living for the, simply for the physical life and are very, very, very protective of themselves. They become highly self-interested because, as you said, they don't want to get sick. They don't want to die. But I think to get them to that point, there was a good 10 years, especially in the last five years, of progressive governments becoming champions of um, these progressive human rights issues like gay marriage and transgender rights and uh, people of colour. And 50% or, or more see this as um, an incredible thing, a great thing. So when the government now says that same government says, we want you to wear masks, we want you to lock down. They say, yes, sir, you know, whereas the people who don't are considered deniers, just like with climate change and just like with Black Lives Matter. You can't question these things or you're considered to be a denier. And that's where we're at now in this country. The mask has become, in every country, the mask has become political. Uh, the virus has become political. It's really quite astonishing. Yeah, and I think I think uh, I think I think you're right. I think it would have been, um, but I think one of the reasons we didn't react in this way to previous pandemics, if you look at you know um, Hong Kong flu, and um, I think 1968, 67, 68, 69, um, it didn't have. Uh, we, we didn't react in this way. You know, Woodstock took place during that pandemic, um, uh, and I think you're right. I think one of the reasons we didn't react in this way is partly because um, uh, religion was much stronger uh, then than it is now. Um, uh, but I think there's another aspect of that which has fueled um, uh, our current crisis, which is that um, scientists uh, and public health experts seem to have effortlessly taken the place of priests of mm. spiritual leaders that's right they have become repositories of the truth but not just truth as we understand scientific truth but also moral truth we look to them not only to uh, lead us out of this crisis scientifically but also morally and as you say the things that we've been asked to do uh, which the scientists have recommended you know, for the most part, not entirely, mm. such as wearing masks, um, have taken on a kind of moral force that we're not just doing it in order to protect ourselves and protect other people. There's, you know, to not do it is now morally taboo. And those who don't are, you know, almost cast out as shameful, as people who don't belong in our community. Um, and, and, and I think that's partly because this class of scientific public health experts have taken on the mantle, the moral leadership that was previously provided by the priesthood. Yeah, definitely. I agree. Uh, 
And just to take a step back, if, if you look at where all this started in terms of the fear being generated, the West was furnished with images from around four or five, maybe six phone cameras of doctors running through the streets in hazmat suits, people being welded into their homes, uh, students being dragged out uh, by their feet of apartment blocks. Then they said, look, it worked. We flattened the curve. So that was exported to the West. And in my opinion, the West has certainly Melbourne was a perfect example of that. Taking the China model and seeing how far we can go with that without infringing on constitutional rights and Western values. So from the very beginning, that fear has almost hit us like a tidal wave and no one's really had a chance to take the step back. And I wonder if some of these politicians are driven by this fear a bit as well. What do you think of that? I mean, I, 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 I don't think that... Um that the Chinese Communist Party um, manufactured this virus and then effectively seeded it in the West and then um, recommended this lockdown policy um, as a way of stress testing the um, strength of uh, liberal democracies and the attachment of their populations to their democratic freedoms. I don't think that well, I don't think there was a conspiracy of that nature. I don't think it was planned in that way. But if it had been, it couldn't have been more effective at That's revealing right. the um, just how weak the West's attachment is to the institutions of liberal democracy. Um, that, that, that's, what, that, that's the kind of really um, depressing thing about this. I mean, I think that um, I think politicians uh, who you would have hoped uh, would have resisted calls to lockdown, resisted the WHO's, you know, advice to follow what this totalitarian society had done as the only way of mitigating the impact of this deadly virus, you would have hoped that there would have been enough politicians, particularly across the Anglosphere, uh, to resist the temptation to exercise power and behave like, mimic the behaviour of totalitarian uh, states like China. Uh, and it's been very disappointing that, that, that we haven't had that political leadership, that almost every political leader across the West has been so terrified of seeing their political careers destroyed by this virus, destroyed by the accusation that they're not doing enough to minimise the number of COVID deaths, that they've been more than willing to um, uh, uh, lock up their populations and um, suspend their ancient liberties uh, just to reduce the overall number of deaths from this one particular virus at the expense of almost everything else. And I think they, that the politicians have judged that, that they've decided that that's what they'll be judged on, mm. that, you know, when, when, when the dust has settled and this is all that's over their legacy, we hope it, that, yeah, that, that's what they'll be judged on at the next election. When they when they face the electorate, uh, the electorate are going to judge them uh, on how well they've done at minimising the number of COVID deaths. And that's the only metric that matters. Doesn't matter about the number of years of education missed by the population school children. Doesn't matter about how many people no. are suffering from no. mental ill health. Doesn't matter about the number of businesses that have closed. Doesn't matter about the national debt. The only thing they'll be judged on, they've decided, is how well, they've managed to minimise COVID deaths. And, um, you know, you would hope that uh, they would have shown a bit more backbone, been a bit more imaginative, less easily pushed around, um, uh, less fearful for their own political futures and thought about something, you know, more transcendent than that. But no, that no, that no single political leader um, uh, has, has done, I think, what a, what, a, what a classical liberal would like to have seen happen. Um, it's been very disappointing. This is about freedom and liberty. 
we do need to keep hammering away at these people because if we can flip more people to kind of acknowledge this or at least ask questions like we've we've done today as in how many people might die from other medical illnesses how many people are lonely right now how many families are not able to bury their loved ones these are the questions that should be far more um, pertinent than we're all in this together because clearly we aren't yeah no i completely agree with you i think um it's never been more important to defend dissent defend skepticism um, and, you know, hasn't been more difficult, at least in liberal democracies, to um, uh, be a, a nonconformist, to challenge the prevailing orthodoxy. Uh, never been more difficult than at this moment. And, um, you know, it's, it's not just that you face social ostracization um, uh, on, you know, you, you, you face um, uh, being censored, particularly by uh, the big tech companies. Uh, so, you know, if, if, if you if you if you express uh, dissent from COVID orthodoxy on YouTube or Twitter or Facebook, you know, you're at risk of losing your account. Um, and, uh, you know, those those companies have absolutely no qualms about silencing those who uh, challenge the prevailing orthodoxy, not just on this, obviously, but in a number of areas. Uh, and that's uh, that is, I think, why the uh, Free Speech Union, the organization I set up last year, which is a, a sort of mass mass membership organization that stands up for the speech rights of its members. So I think it's, it's, it's very important. OK, so Free Speech Union, could you tell me a little bit about this and, and why it's so important right now? Sure. So um, uh, I think that free speech um, hasn't been in such peril um, since the Second World War across the West. Um, and uh, we see that in a in a range of areas. Um, but uh, the cultural attachment to free speech, which used to be part of the, DN the sort of political DNA um, uh, in societies across the Anglosphere, um, that has been waning. Um, and these days, free speech is sort of caricatured as um, a a right that only benefits male, pale and stale conservatives. Um, and uh, we see speech, speech rights, you know, under attack um, in numerous spheres, but particularly uh, in universities, in schools, in the charitable sector, in the media, um, uh, uh, in the in the arts, particularly the performing arts. Um, uh, at where, where, where the kind of woke cult has kind of, uh, 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 metastasized and, and taken on the form of a kind of, uh, evangelical fundamentalist faith. Um, and, uh, uh, last year in February, um, I and some other people, uh, set up this new mass membership organization called the Free Speech Union, um, which, uh, stands up for the speech rights of its members and when when those members get into trouble uh, we do what we can to um, defend them uh, so i'll give you an example um, a guy called nick buckley uh, set up a charity in manchester called mancunian way which works with disadvantaged young people in manchester he set it up in i think uh, 2009 um, uh, maybe 2011 and um, it's a very successful charity he was given uh, an MBE in 2019 for his charitable work. Uh, in 2020, at the height of the um, BLM, global BLM protest movement, um, he wrote a short blog um, uh, uh, criticising some aspects of the Black Lives Matter organisation and its agenda. Um, Nothing particularly unreasonable or inflammatory, uh, perfectly reasonable criticisms of a political organization that describes itself as Marxist and has amongst its objectives wanting to defund the police and the nuclear family and dismantle capitalism. Um, and uh, after writing this perfectly reasonable mainstream blog post, and you know, his main concern was that um, uh, if um, if if. Uh, the identity politics of the BLM organization uh, began to gain any traction on the streets of Manchester amongst young people. He thought it could lead to racial conflict, that 
organizations like BLM want to racialize young people, make them conscious of their ethnic identity in a way that they haven't been before and um, encourage young African Caribbean Britons to uh, be more resentful, uh, to develop a sense of grievance, um, uh, to see racism in British society where it may not exist and which they may not have seen before. Um, and uh, he was concerned that this would lead to uh, racial conflict on the streets of Manchester, having worked with young people in Manchester for all these years. Um, uh, anyway, so this was this was this was the kind of uh, this is more or less what he said in his in his blog post. And um, a petition was started on change.org. Uh, demanding that the trustees of this charity, which he himself had started and which he was running, um, fire him as the CEO of this charity because of his um, unacceptable views uh, about BLM. And um, it only got 400 signatures. Uh, But nonetheless, the, the trustees did exactly what the petition was asking of them and fired him. And um, luckily, he was um, a member of the Free Speech Union. And we were able to find him um, uh, a pro bono charity lawyer um, who uh, uh, looked at the manner in which he'd been fired, uh, discovered that the trustees hadn't followed the proper procedure and that they were, in fact, liable um, for his unpaid salary. I think dating till the end of 2022, personally liable. And when this was pointed out to them, um, uh, they 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 resigned one by one. Um, and we also started a counter petition uh, or helped promote a counter petition uh, saying he should be reinstated, which got, I don't know, something like over 15,000 signatures. And um, in the end, all the trustees resigned and he was reinstated. Um, and uh, it was a good example, I think, of how someone had been cancelled, um, but just for challenging the kind of fashionable orthodoxy of the day. Um, uh, and uh, we had managed to step in and effectively uncancel him and get him restored to his old job. And we've had about, I don't know, maybe a dozen similar successes like that over the past year and lots of minor successes as well. I mean, you know, we're one organisation fighting against, um, you know, uh, 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 untold armies of enemies of free speech, but... um, you know, I think we have been able to make a difference to some people. Uh, and we, we're, we're hoping to set up a branch in the US uh, later this year. And in due course, I think if, if that if that if that works, then a branch in Australia and elsewhere. Oh, it's needed ASAP in this country. What a great idea. That's free speech union dot org is the address. Yeah. Yeah. Free speech union dot org. And we do accept um, overseas members. If anyone listening uh, wants to join, uh, we can't offer all the um legal protections that we currently offer our members in the UK, but there are some things we can do. So, for instance, um, uh, uh, there was a, a, an academic at the University of Chicago um, who was mobbed recently because um, he uh, took issue with um, the affirmative action uh, approach to recruiting students and faculty at the University of Chicago, I think, in his department. Um, and um, an open letter was circulated accusing him of being, you know, a racist and saying that students of colour didn't feel safe being taught by him. And he, all complete nonsense. And um, uh, we started a petition uh, calling on the president of the University of Chicago to issue a statement reaffirming the University of Chicago's commitment to free speech and the famous Chicago principles, which are the kind of gold standard for academic free speech. And um, three days after we started that petition, he did indeed issue just such a statement. And I think that means that uh, this poor professor who was under fire in his department is now safe. Um, he can't be fired. He can't be denuded of any of his teaching responsibilities because the president has spoken. He said, no, you know, we, we, we believe in free speech at this university and people should not be persecuted, should not suffer any detriment simply for um, uh, saying what they believe about an issue of, you know, r- appropriate public debate. Fantastic. Toby Young, you're a good man and you're doing some good things over there. Good to talk to you. Good on you, mate. Thank you very much.